For those of you that might be new, in case you're wondering, yes, Paige is as cool and as wonderful as she sounds. <laughs> you should get to know her. Let's bow in prayer and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father, thank you for a day in February where the sun is shining and there's the wind, cold wind is not blowing. And we can gather together as your people, both virtually and in person, and open our minds and our hearts as we worship you and now as we come to your word. We, we confess that there's lots of messages bombarding us all week long, and so we gather now and ask you to speak to us through your word, to break through the noise and the distractions and speak clearly to our minds and hearts that we might understand you more and follow you more. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. True wisdom consists in an accurate knowledge of God and an accurate knowledge of yourself. John Calvin said that in his Institutes. He goes on to say that you cannot have one without the other. That an accurate knowledge of yourself flows out of an accurate knowledge of God. People debate that today, would disagree with it, but that's really at the heart of what our series, The Gospel in Genesis, has been about. How do we understand who we are without understanding what God says about who we are, about who he is, our origin story, the good news in the beginning? We've looked at the good news of creation, the good news of the creator, the good news of being made in the image of God, the Imago Dei, the good news of Sabbath rest for God's people who would rest in him. And today... We're going to look at the good news of God's limits, boundaries, commands. Maybe some of you are going, oh, whoa, time out. <laughs> rules are not good news. When I was young, I did not view rules at home or at school as good news. Anybody relate to that? I saw those as things to be broken, to be messed with, to be pushed. But we're going to come to the part of the story of Genesis where God begins to lay some boundaries for our lives, some parameters for our lives. Good news requires the breath of God, we'll see, the commands of God, the boundaries of God, the limits of God. Genesis 2 is really all about God's commands and human freedom and how those things intersect. There's an inescapable re reality that if there is a good creator, which we've been studying through Genesis chapter 1 and 2, behind the universe, then it stands to reason that his instructions and boundaries are critical to what it means to, to live free and according to his design. So we'll look at Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 through 17. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If not, you'll see it in large print on the screen. Genesis 2, verse 4. These are the generations of he the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made it to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Medellium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. We'll stop there. That's more than enough to cover in one, uh, one, one sermon. Now, I know that some of you might, if you've been read through Genesis before, it might sound like a little bit of a contradictory account. We just finished Genesis chapter 1 a couple of weeks ago, where we saw the creation account of the heavens and the earth. And this one, if, you, if you're paying attention, sounds like, wait, wait, the chronology sounds different. 
It sounds like things are out of order compared to Genesis 1. And that's uh, an accurate observation if this was a second creation account. But it's not. It's not recounting what happened. It's meant to zoom us in on a couple aspects of creation. So don't, don't, it, I think we get off track if we try to compare Genesis 2 with Genesis 1 and see do the, does the chronology match up. It's not a chronological account. It's a theological account. It's zooming in on what it means to be made in the image of God, how God did that, and what, what, that, what the implications are for our lives. There's a lot of symbolism in this passage, symbolic meaning uh, that has profound significance for our lives. Trees and rivers and the breath of God and a garden and so on. So we're going to try and make sense of at least most of it. Let's look at verse 4 once more. This is a crucial verse. We'll spend a bit of time on this verse. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. These are the generations. If you read through Genesis, you'll find that phrase 12 different times. Ele toladol shamayim eretz in Hebrew. It, it shows up over and over again. And almost every time, except for this time, it's followed by a genealogy. You know, those long, difficult lists of names in the Bible that you skip over when you do your Bible reading. <laughs> These are the generations. And it, it, what it's meant to do is to mark a new section. Okay, now we're going to go to this section of the genealogy, this part of the story, this part of the family line. And it shows up for the first time here, and it's meant to do the same thing. This is a different section. This is the story of us. Not the show, but the actual story of us. This is where it started for us. It's turning into a new section. Robert Alter in his commentary writes, human beings are now the pivot of the story, where in Genesis chapter 1, they were the climax of the story. Chapter 1 is God's creation of the heavens and earth, finishing with the creation of human beings, the crown of his creation in his image. Chapter 2 now, we're the pivot on which the story turns. Everything is told in relation to man, Alter writes. Even the primeval earth is shown as awaiting man's arrival, in verse 5. The narrative works outward from man to his environment. Garden, trees, rivers, beasts, birds, all to reveal the world as we are meant to see and understand it. A place expressly prepared for our arrival, our delight, and our discipline. Now, when you see the word man in here, and I'm using the word man in that quote, it is the word, Hebrew word, hadam, ha-adam. It means human, the person. So uh, Adam, we call him Adam as if that's his name, Adam. Some of you might be named Adam, but in Hebrew, Adam is not an actual proper name. Ha-adam means human beings. So when I say man, don't get, it applies to us all, is my point. A picture of creation awaiting our arrival. Verses 5 and 6, you might read those and think, well, what, what does that all mean? A picture of creating creation awaiting the arrival of Ha'adam, men and women, to care for it, to harness its power, to produce from it, to delight in it, to love it, and to love God through it. Something else amazing about verse 4, you notice there on the, on the if you look up at the screen there, it says the generations of the heavens and the earth, and then it finishes with the earth and the heavens. You see how the same phrase repeated in different order? Heavens and the earth, earth and heavens. In Hebrew, that's called a chiasm. And it's meant to say what is in between. Like you, you repeat the same phrase in the, in the opposite order, and it's meant to point you back to what's in the center. So what's in the center there? Look, look up there for a minute. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth, when they were created. In the day the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. The center is that the name, the Lord God. It's written, and it's hard for us to grasp in English. That's what it's meant to do. The Lord God. Now, throughout Genesis 1, we see God referred to in the Hebrew word Elohim. It's the general, like the Almighty. And it's plural. We saw that, meaning God existing in three persons. Here in Genesis 2, and it's the only phrase used to refer to God throughout this chapter, is a different name of God, Yahweh Elohim. Now, Yahweh is the sacred name of God that God gave to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. Remember this? Moses sees the burning bush, and he doesn't want to go back to Egypt. He's afraid, and he says, well, what if, I don't know what to say, and what if they, what if they don't like me, and he's all the excuses. And then he has one question, what if they ask me who sent me? What should I say to them? What is your name? And God says, I am that I am. Tell them, I am sent you. I am is Yahweh. 
the sacred personal name of God. So here we see in Genesis 2, God revealed as the personal God, not Elohim the Almighty, not any God, not, but Yahweh Elohim, all throughout chapter 2. That's crucial to understand. The personal covenant God is the center of the story because we're going to zoom in and it's going to get very personal when he forms men and women, when he makes us. This name, by the way, shows up in a number of places. Exodus 34, verses six through seven, maybe the most famous place, the most profound place to understand what this name means. Exodus 34, verses six through seven. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord. And whenever you see the Lord in all caps, some of you already know this, L-O-R-D in all caps, that is the word Yahweh. With a capital L, small O-R-D, that's usually the word uh, for uh, Jehovah. or or, excuse me, for Lord, a lowercase. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. This is the God who we're gonna read about in Genesis 2. Abounding in steadfast love and mercy and compassion and faithfulness. Yahweh Elohim, is his name. Look at verse seven. Genesis 2, seven. There's probably two central verses, this one in verse 17 at the end, but verse seven. Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. There's an obvious contrast here between dust and breath of life, right? Dust of the ground and breath of life. We're meant to see that contrast. We are both matter and spirit. Maybe you heard ashes to ashes, dust to dust, right? At a funeral service, a pastor or a priest might say that. You read through the scriptures and you see in the book of Job and the Psalms and the prophets, we're, we're just dust. We're like grass that the wind blows away. It's true. The, the Genesis account doesn't deny that we are mortal. We're made from the stuff of earth. But we're more than that. We're dust and we have the breath of life breathed into us. Our mortality is an inescapable reality. We are dust, but that's not all that we are. The breath of life, this is the first thing, if you're taking notes, the, the, the major points, the breath of life. Abundant life is given by the breath of God. This passage is really a description of what it means to live abundantly, to live inside of God's relationship with God, how we're meant to live. Abundant life is given by the breath of God. In Genesis 1.27, we're made in the image of God. In Genesis 2.7, we're, 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 we're brought to life by the breath of God. The breath of God is the word ruach. Same word, uh, root word used in Genesis 1 when the spirit of the Lord hovered over the surface of the waters. It can mean wind, breath, or spirit. And we become a living creature. Ezekiel 37 tells the story of God breathing on dry bones. The prophet has this image of God bringing to life that which is dead. And he says, I'll breathe on you, dry bones. Put flesh on you. Breathe life into you, and you'll live. Psalm 104 says, when you take away their breath, they die and return to dust. God gives you life by his ruach, his breath, and he takes it away when you cease to breathe. It's a bummer to lose your ruach. Right? You don't, you're, it's over for you on this earth. Take a minute, just take a, I want you to just, I know this is silly, maybe, but those watching online and here in person, take a deep breath for a minute, ready? One more. Before you breathe too much on the person in front of you. You ever stop and think about your ability to do what we just did is a gift of God. You don't even think about it. It's unconscious. In fact, later, in about the 5th or 6th century AD, Jewish rabbis would describe breathing as speaking the name of God, Yahweh. The Hebrew letters are yod he vah he So yod he vah they, they believe that this, they, they come up with this idea that you, God gave you breath, and to breathe is to speak his name. And when you can no longer speak his name or breathe, you die and return to dust. 
the breath of life. Life exists by the breath of God. I remember years ago being in an Angola prison in the Louisiana State Penitentiary. I took a group of men from our church. I've been there a couple of times, but this one particular time we visited there, they had in, the, the men there are serving, um, on average, 80 year sentences, most of them doing life. It's the, it's the maximum security, one of the hardest prisons in the, in the country. And we were, they have an in, in prison hospice care unit for those that have terminal illnesses. And the, some of the prisoners, some of the inmates themselves, are the care nurses for the other inmates who are dying. It's a really remarkable thing. Many of them are believers. I sat with a guy named Odin who was sitting with a man dying who had been sort of an older father figure to him in prison, dying of terminal cancer, and he was uh, a shell of a person, lying in bed, ashen. Just, you could just see he's, this is not, he's not long for this world. And in fact, in the two hours I sat with him and we prayed and um, he played, we were playing cards and he played both hands and told him how he was doing, the guy who was dying. and Read scripture to him and even sang to him. And while we were there, this man took his last breath. You could hear it. And then passed. You could, you could see the Ruach leave him. But knowing also that he knew the Lord. It's really amazing to stop and think about that fact. Our breathing is a gift of God. Our life exists as his gift. So the whole picture here in verse seven is so intensely personal. We see it in these verbs, formed and breathed. Here's this quote from Derek Kidner. Formed expresses the relation of a craftsman to material with implications of both skill and of sovereignty, which man forgets in his peril. Breathed is warmly personal with the face-to-face -face intimacy of a kiss and the significance that this was an act of, of giving as well as making and divine self-giving at that. I can't help but read it and think about like, what does it mean that God breathed on him? Was it like a slow breath and he go, Pum! like, how did it work? You know, I don't know. It's metaphoric, of course, but uh, it's not saying God has nostrils. But it, the point is, like, like moms and dads, when you grab your child's face and draw it close, right? There's, there's the intimacy that God is, is lovingly giving life to his creation. Do you think of your life that way? God holds you by the cheeks, you know? Gave you life when you came into this world. This whole scene is a beautiful picture of God's loving care for human beings. Forming, breathing, planting, and placing man and woman in the garden. Speaking of that, look at verses 8 and 9 of the text once more. Genesis 2, 8 and 9. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Again, so much symbolism here. God plants and establishes the garden. Now, he's already made all the universe, but inside of the world, the earth, he's made a, spe a specific place for us to live with boundaries and parameters. And inside of that place, the garden, he puts everything that's good to see and good for food. That means... There are some things that uh, God makes that are just beautiful. They serve a purpose, but not necessarily to us. They're just beautiful. Like, for example, there are, there, if you need to get across a river, you could build a bridge. And it might, the bridge might just be like, we got to get over the river, so let's just do the simplest, cheapest, most functional bridge we can build. If you're walking, maybe it's a rope and, some, and a few planks, and you can get across. If you're driving, it might be something. But there are other bridges in the world that are, and you've driven on these, the Golden Gate Bridge, the Charles Bridge in, in, in uh, Prague, bridges that are so beautiful, you drive a hundred miles or more out of your way just to go across them because you just want to see them. So some things God makes in his world are not just functional, they're beautiful, good, for, they're pleasing to the eye. <gasps> Take our breath away. And good for food, they, they feed us as well. The picture is God's filling his world, this garden, with things that are both functional and beautiful, pleasurable, filling us with delight. That's what he's doing. Notice every tree. 
We want to jump right to the limits, which we'll get to in a minute. But just consider for a minute how much beauty and goodness and pleasure men and women are free to enjoy. The tree of life, for example. The tree of life. Next slide. There we are. Abundant life is sustained by the provision of God. The tree of life symbolizes the fact that we're not immortal in ourselves. Our life is given by God's breath and sustained by God's provision. So we disconnect from him and it's over. Humans were free to eat of any tree in the garden except one, which would include the tree of life. Access to life, in other words, is given by the breath of God and the provision of God. Our life now and our life in eternity is dependent on access to his, God's provision. Look at verses 10 through 14. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and it became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Bedellium, which I don't know what that is, and Onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Now, scholars have read this. People have debated this. Okay, where is the Garden of Eden? We have a description here, a geographical description. We've got four rivers. Can we find it? Well, we do know that today, the Tigris and Euphrates River, they converge and separate just, just north of the Persian Gulf and what's Iraq today, southern Mesopotamia in the ancient world. But what about the Pishon and the Gihon? Where are they? There's no rivers named that on earth today. And it's hard to figure out well, what's the intersection of these rivers. This is an exercise, again, in missing the point. There's lots of those in Genesis 1 and 2. God did not give us like a geographical code so we could go find the Garden of Eden. It's a metaphoric description of a place designed for us in which we live and experience full life in God. And I think we see this in the names of the rivers. You'll see them here on the screen. The Pishon means increase. Gihon means bursting forth. The tigr word Tigris means rapidly, quickly. Euphrates, fruitfulness. Think about that. Bursting forth, increasing fruitfulness rapidly. Like it's, the, it's a description of a world in which we are meant to live in relationship to God in which there's fruitfulness and increase and joy and abundance. Surrounded by these rivers. And the river, by the way, for the Hebrew mind, was a picture of life. Jesus calls himself the river right, of life, the, the water of life. River was a good thing. The sea was scary. The abyss. This is all pictures meant to symbolize God made you, gave you life. God sustains you. God has placed you in a, in a world in which he means for you to live in relationship to him and experience fullness. At the center of it all, the tree of life. The tree of life is an important symbol throughout the story of the Bible. You could, we could do the entire sermon just on the symbolism of the tree of life. It's a theme picked up in the prophets, in Psalms, in Proverbs, uh, in many places. In a couple of weeks, we're going to see the, how we cut ourselves off from access to this tree of life. But the really good news, this is the story of the gospel in Genesis, is that the tree of life comes back. Did you know this? The tree of life isn't just gone in Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 3. It comes back at the end of the story. Look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, and 22, verse 1 and 2. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal. There it is, the river of life. Flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb of God in the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. The point is, we will cut ourselves off from this access, but God is not done. In fact, in Galatians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul refers to the cross as a tree. The curse of the tree, where Christ takes on our curse so that we might have access again to the life that he offers. But again, that's, we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit in the story. There's more in the story that shows us how to live in the abundant life, and this brings us to the command of life. 
And for, for uh, our purposes, this is probably the most important section of this text for us. Abundant life is found within the limits of God. Let me say that again. Abundant life, full life, is found inside of the rules, commands, boundaries, and limits of God. You might be thinking, like I have often thought, and our, our world certainly says, wait a second. Restrictions, boundaries, limits, rules, those are holding me back from something. How can I have fullness without freedom to do what I want? The cultural view is that any limit or restriction placed on you, on your sense of your identity, on your moral choices, on what you want to do, any restriction placed on you is holding you back from fulfillment. Genesis 2 is saying, no, not so. You're being lied to. Look at verses 15 through 17 of the last part of our text. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. This goes back to Genesis 128, the, the mandate of dominion and, and caring for creation. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden. By the way, that phrase, you may surely eat, in the, the New International Version, and in the, the Christian Standard Bible, it's translated, you are free to eat of every tree of the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. The day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Before we get worked up about the restriction here, there's only one. Look at the freedom. Think about it. The diversity, the beauty, the glory of what God has done and said, you're free, you're free. Enjoy it all. Live in relationship to me. Do what you will. Care for creation. Delight in creation. Enjoy it. Enjoy each other. Get creative. Produce things. Build things. Invent things. Just one rule. Just one rule. Don't eat of that tree. You're gonna have to trust me on this one. I made you and all that you see. Don't eat of that tree. You, you know how it goes. But it's amazing freedom here. Free to explore, free to cultivate, free to build, free to enjoy, free to produce, free to work, free to rest. And free to choose. Free to choose. Free to choose to receive the good that God offers. And by definition, free to not. Free to reject. The capacity, the choice to continue to depend on the creator who gave us life by his breath and sustains our life by his provision and shows us life by his command. Or to say, no, no, I think I know better. This is where the tree of the knowledge of good and evil comes in. Now, knowledge does not mean just knowing things. It doesn't mean moral discernment. Because God has already given Adam and the command, right? Do not eat of this tree. So he already knows, like, there's one thing I should not do and a lot of things I can do. So God's not holding Adam accountable for something he doesn't know yet. He does know. It doesn't mean moral discernment. It also does not mean that God's trying to keep certain things. Some people say, well, see, this is, this is the problem, right? God's, like, God is uh, withholding knowledge from you. You can know a whole bunch of stuff outside of God. You don't need God at all. You, know, you need science and uh, modern uh, technology. And that's all you need. This is, by the way, the root of the, the lie that we believe in Genesis 3, which we'll get to in a couple of weeks. The, the, the key, though, is understanding the, the verb, the Hebrew word for to know, the word yada. It can mean know or understand, but it's most often used to describe um, choosing, determining, establishing, making a choice and acting on it. For example, uh, when it says that a man will know his wife, it doesn't just mean understand her. Some of you know what I'm talking about, but you can read that later. So eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil means choosing good and evil based on your idea of what's right and wrong. It means choosing between God's standard and self-determination. It means to place yourself at the center and say, I am now the arbiter of what is morally right or wrong. So either God's at the center or we are. There are only two alternatives. 
So ultimately, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a symbol of the choice between the divine will or self-will. Which will I trust as my guide, as my true north, as my understanding of what's right and what's wrong? And this quote from C.S. Lewis from his classic work, Mere Christianity. Why then did God give them free will? You ever wonder this question? Like if he knows it's gonna go wrong, why not just make it impossible for them to screw up? Because free will, though it makes evil possible, is also the only thing that makes possible any love or goodness or joy worth having. I love that line. A world of automata, of creatures that work like machines, would hardly be worth creating. The creatures, the happiness which God designs for us as his higher creatures, is the happiness of being freely, voluntarily united to him and to each other in an experience of love and delight compared with which the most rapturous love between a man and a woman on this earth is mere milk and water. And for that, they've got to be free. What God intends for you can only be had by choosing him, trusting him, surrendering to him. We understand this on a human level, right? If somebody is trying to force someone to love them, we'd say, that's, that's not love. But you need to see somebody or maybe get arrested. That's, not a, that's a problem. It must be freely chosen. And this is what God is doing. So love requires freedom, choice, and freedom requires boundaries. Now that's where our culture says, oh, oh no way. Love requires freedom, and freedom requires limits. Think about it. We think of freedom as, no, no limits. I can do whatever I want to do, whenever I want to do it, how I want to do it, and when I want to do it. But that can't be what freedom really means. Because if it is, some of your choices are self-destructive and damaging and hurtful. Some of mine are. God wants us to know good and evil through relationship with him, our creator. As one scholar put it, God intends that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil means we're either gonna know good and evil through obedience to him and relationship with him and harmony with him or by rebellion and therefore from above with relationship or from below by in slavery to sin. You choose. Let me put it to you this way. And if you've written nothing else down, maybe jot this one down or snap a picture of it because it's worth meditating on. The limits and boundaries of God are provisions of his love for our good and our abundant life. The rules, the commands, the limits, the boundaries that God gives to us are flowing from his love and meant for our good and living an abundant life. The genius of the creator is woven into creation, Genesis 1, and revealed in the creator's commands, Genesis 2. Like, how many of you have Ikea furniture in your house? Anybody? Oh, that, only that few. Some of you are like, yeah, that's too hard, right? <laughs> the, the, the genius of, if there is genius, of the, uh, the Ikea furniture is that it's, it's in the instructions. Like, you are free to just skip steps 10 through 16. Right? <laughs> Sometimes I want to. You're free to say, I don't need this screw in this, with this wooden peg. But you're, you're not going to experience the beauty of the, of the design. I remember putting together a, some stuff for my daughter in her, in her college uh, dorm. God has woven his genius and beauty and delight into creation, Genesis 1, and revealed it in his commands, Genesis 2. What God commands is not arbitrarily good. It's good because he is good. And all goodness and truth and beauty flows out of who he is. So what's true freedom then? Obeying God. Now, that sounds ridiculous in our culture. True human freedom is found in obedience to the one who made you in his image, who formed you, who breathed life into you, who placed you in a world of his making, and who has told you how to live an abundant life. So freedom means to choose well, not just to choose anything. You can reject that, and we all have. But to our peril and ultimate destruction. Freedom is not life without boundaries or limits. It's choosing to live within the right ones. By the way, that's at the heart of our, our good design uh, event coming up. And so much of what the Bible has to say, freedom is not life without limits. 
It's choosing with enough wisdom and humility to live within the right ones. The ones that God, the God who made you is telling you. My whole life I've struggled with this. Maybe you have as well. I, some, some children, like my oldest son, come out of the womb and they're rule followers. They're good at it. Other children, like my youngest one, not so much. <laughs> like his father. Right? But inside every one of us is this, this deep desire to do it our way. And we're going to get there in a couple of weeks. But for now, I want to leave you with that thought again. True freedom is not choosing anything you want. It's choosing well. Choosing the right boundaries and limits. Because the joy and love and beauty and truth of the creator is in his creation and in his commands. Given because he loves you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this, these truths, which if we're honest with ourselves and with you, we, we chafe under. We want to resist. We want to say, yeah, but. I know that I do. And so, Lord, we, we acknowledge that. And best we can, as frail as we are, we submit again, recognizing that we don't know best. We don't see everything. And we want to live an abundant, full life and that can only be had in the boundaries and parameters and limits that you set out of your love and goodness for us. We thank you, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I know you've all got your plans to go root for the Eagles. But if you're here this morning and you just feel like you want someone to pray for you or pray with you for any reason, members of our prayer team are always available in the classroom right out in the lobby as you leave. Now, brothers and sisters, May the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ fill you and sustain you now and forever. Amen. And go in peace.